Okay, are we ready to read Beowulf chapter one? Let's go. Woo um, hoo. So the famous first few lines, which is all almost anyone knows or has heard in the original. What way gardena in yerdalgum theod kuninga thrum ye frunon, who the athling as Ellen Fremedon? Oft shield shave and share than a triatum, monogum maithum, male settler of teach, et so the ero, than arras where the fair shaft funden. So, let's break this down. What is the famous, like, what listen? We of the spear danes, so it's like we spear danes in y your days, days of your. Um, th thrum, the might of the failed kinning, the people, kings. Um, may we all learn. Who are the Athelingas Ellen Fremadon? How the princes achieved a noble task. Oft shield shaving, shearthen at the or monogum maithum, male settler oft hech, et shod erl, said an arras where the fair shaft funden. Um, Often shield shaving with the threats of shavers, and that's like enemies. Um, remove the um, mead seats from many people. So these mead seats are like benches in halls that people would be gathered around, and removing them from your enemy is a thing you do with conquest. You're basically saying that you don't have a right to gather as a community in this way and actually the idea of the hall and the community therein is really really important psychological insecurity for Beowulf um Vaughan yes uh, I'll turn the music down further um let me just do that yeah there we are nice and quiet right um oh cool walking to the Zooth market nice um cool so Shield shaving has taken away the mead seats from many people. Ed sort of earl, he sort of terrified the earls. So then Ardest where the fair shaft funden. Um since first or um first um what's the word? He became poor. So this is like after shield shaving was impoverished, he sort of came to power and he took away the mead seats from many. Not chapter two, sorry, part Part two lines seven B to eleven. Hey, that's frofri abad, where ox under walknum, where the mindum thach, off that him I will stara umstendra of a honor of a huran shoulder, gomban gildan, that was God cooning. So he sort of experienced consolation of this or for this. So this is referring to him having been impoverished before. Um, Weox under the walknum, he grew, and we have this in, in modern English as like wax. It's so like the, the waxing moon is one that's growing, and like a waning moon is one that's declining or shrinking. Same thing here, Weox, like he grew under the clouds. Uh, um sort of he prospered with worthiment. Of that him, I will tharva umsitendra, offer hrana rara hurvan shoulder. So, until each of the um, sitting around, so those are the people who are sitting around the the mead settler, the mead benches, the mead seats, like we saw earlier. Um, him, like him or of him, over the Hranrad, and this is one of the famous kennings in Beowulf, which is the Whale Road. Um, until each of them had to hear him over the Whale Road, uh, Gomban Gildan. Gomban is a tribute to Gildan is pay. So each of those people sitting around the me benches um, had to obey him over the um, sorry, so those sitting around the benches over the um, the whale road had to um, obey him and to pay tribute. How did I learn the pronunciation? So um, goodness. There are some videos of this online, but actually IMO, one of the better ways is to just go to I'll show you guys and I'll give you guys a link Anglo-Saxon Allowed it's a project by um, a professor of Old English called Michael Drought and he has recorded audio versions of literally every single bit of 
old English poetry that we have, and it's all, you can download it all for free on this website, except for Beowulf, which he makes you pay for, but that's fair enough, everyone wants to hear Beowulf. Um, so you can hear him pronouncing Cadman's hymn. So, um, I listened to this over and over again, and I got really used to hearing it pronounced. I'm posting this link in chat. Um, it's really nice to just listen to while you're walking around because honestly some of it's just beautiful like sounding poetry. Old English poetry places a lot of emphasis on sounds and that's one of the reasons why I'm going to try and find a um I'll try to find an example of this because Old English poetry does this thing of repeating itself for no ostensible reason but the reason is um poetic. So they they want to they want to repeat what they're saying but with really pretty words here we are so um right so um uh you wouldn't even will you see that's been a week um so may the um the well-wishing companions remain when the battle comes um louder your last the abandoned peoples so Leoda Yelastin and uh, the Wunigan Williasithas, sorry, sorry, the Williasithas, they're the same uh, group of people, but they're repeating the thing, they're repeating the phrase in order to maybe have a um, alliteration on different sounds. So, Leoda uh, Yelastin, they might have put that in there to get the alliteration on the L, for instance. Um, yeah. So. You see it a lot, particularly in religious poetry in Old English, where they'll they have many words for Lord and Savior, and they'll just mix them up because um, because they feel like it. Um, in fact, in Cadman's hymn that you just heard, "Nushul and Harry and Helfon riches where where will our Father on his more you thank?" Um, you know, where will our Father is like the work of the Wonder Father, and his more you thank is um, and his thought, his intention. Um, is the misspelling of the written word a good indication of the pronunciation? Yes, and actually, so we have the electronic Beowulf right here, and this fortunately lets us look at the manuscript. Let me give an example Beowulf. Here we are. So, this, which page is this on? This is on 173V, so we can go to the manuscript itself, and I can show you guys where it says um, Beowulf. Also, just a um, nerd moment, but I feel I think this is so much fun just going to the manuscript and being like, let's let's see what Beowulf says in the manuscript. So why can't I move this? Oh god. Let me move you, god damn it. Okay, here we are. Right. Um So it'll be down there somewhere. Seventy It's Beowulf yeah. Who lump you on ladder? Who lump? Because here we are, I think. Yes, here we are. Look down there. Can I zoom in on that? Why can't I zoom in? Ah, right. It's right at the bottom of the in the corner. There, can we see B I O W U L F? Right, and it's um I'm highlighting it here as well. Um who lump air on ladder, lay off a bit Beowulf. Um, how did it come to you in your journey? Um, dear Beowulf. Um now this yeah, bottom left. So this implies that even though elsewhere in the poem they're spelling it as Beowulf, and do we even have another one here? Um anyway, most of the poem is with an E, it's Beowulf. But misspelling it with an I here suggests that in this period the I and the E were quite similar in terms of how they sounded. So, and some scholars have speculated that this is an older spelling, so it comes from an older time. Some of the um, some of the uses of language in this poem seems to suggest that it's older. So the word the use of this word um, this is the thorn, ash, and an S, so thas, um, in older periods it can mean like at this time it's literally of this but in in older periods it meant of this time and the fact that it's used this way in Beowulf but it's not really used that way in later poems suggests that 
The poem of Beowulf was composed um, a few centuries earlier. In fact, it might be one of the oldest um, old English poems that we have surviving, and it was written down in the um, 10 hundreds when we have this manuscript from. Um, so yeah, here's another example up there, right? So, um, a Guther with Grendel up there, um, in battle with Grendel or against Grendel. Now, they might have been pronouncing this as Grindel or something like this, because if the I is similar enough to an E, it might have been that way. Or it could have been that, um, the I was close to an E. So this word, um, with, it might have been closer to with. And these are some of the ways that we can get a sense, Jack, of how words were pronounced based on misspellings. So it's a good question to ask. Um, goodness. Jackson Crawford has a good video on this. Um, now, now it's for Old Norse, but uh, it will help you nonetheless. So let me look that up and I'll post a link in chat. Because um, he goes into the evidence for how it works. Um, Jackson Crawford, Old Norse pronunciation. Uh, pronunciation of Old Norse, and I think he's going to, exp he explains in this video how they know how Old Norse at the time was pronounced. Um, so that's a good video for it. With Old English, generally a lot of our content is muddled by the fact that we don't have that much that's written in dialects. Most of what we have is written in, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Most of the stuff we have is written in some form of standard West Saxon. So, when you have a standard dialect, that can obscure how people are pronouncing it. Because if you're just writing everything in your standard dialect, then you're not writing it how you're saying it. So, you know. Anyway, that, let's go back to reading through chapter one. So, that was God Kinning. Um, that was a good king. This is a famous line, and actually, this line gets repeated over and over again in the poem. Um, Somebody asks, on repetition, is that a sign of an oral tradition like Homer's Rosy Fingered Dawn, etc.? Being repeated to give the poet time to think of what they're going to say next. Um, yeah, I've heard stuff to that effect. Um, and certainly we don't see this in poetry, which seems like it's more like to have been uh, written as well as spoken. So, um, Bede's poem, uh, De, De, sorry, um, the Judgment Day poem in Old English, which is a very elaborate translation into Latin of Bede's poem um, on Judgment Day, right? So it's an original poem, De Die, De Die Judici, in Latin. Um, the people who are reading this poem are monks. The people who are going to translate it into Old English are also going to be monks, and they're going to access the original poem in writing. Um, so probably they're going to be translating it into writing with written materials as well. Um, they're probably not reciting a tradition. Whereas some poems like Beowulf or um, the Old English Genesis, etc., the Exodus poem, these have more evidence of being, um, uh, of repetition as a means of helping poets to recite. But one thing is that it doesn't necessarily just have to be for the um, poet themselves, because it can be for the audience as well. And in fact, if I go back to the thing and I look at the manuscript, um, let's see, here we are. I think it'll be next one that we'll have a marker that, we, that I can use to show you what I mean. Um, because the, man, the Beowulf manuscript itself is, here we are, right. It's made up in a way that it will help you to follow, well, no, not to follow what's going on, but it'll help to break up the poem in such a way that it can be more easily digested. So here we have... The, we have the numeral XXV4, um, and that's it. So these are the chapters the Beowulf is based on. So when I say chapter one, it's because in the manuscript itself, it's like chapter one. And each of these, it takes a certain amount of time to say them. And I think that these chapters are put into place to fit around certain kinds of time that were... We don't know if these were put in by sort of the monks who were writing this down or if they were originally a part of the poem. It's, it's really hard to tell. I'm sure there are maybe some poetic and linguistic things you can do to work it out, but I'm not smart enough to know that stuff. The point is that for the monks who were writing it down, it was worthwhile to include this. So what this suggests to me is that 
the lengths of these chapters. So if we scroll down to the next chapter, and they vary a bit in length, but not by that much. Here we are, up down to chapter 30. So all of that stuff. How many lines is that? That is about, it's about a hundred lines, a little over a hundred lines per chapter. And I think that these divisions are made because they're a convenient stopping place when you're reciting the poem at a feast or something. So maybe these monks would be sitting down to eat their lunch and somebody would be like, what, where gardena? And they would listen to this while they were eating or while um, that while there was a break, etc. So these devices might be there for the benefit of an audience as well who's hearing them. So an audience who might be, you know, half paying attention, they might be listen, eating their food, they hear that was God kuning, they're like, oh right, I get it. Because if we look at it, actually, if we look at what it's actually doing, so all of this, like, you know, we, we spear Danes, let's, let's hear about the, the good old kings. Um, let's hear about this particular king, uh, shield shaving, blah, blah, blah. He, he took away the bead seeds, etc. And then maybe the poet would have emphasized it, like spoke louder. That was God, Kuning. And um, Benjamin Bagby is an amazing early musician and a performer of Old English poetry, in particular Beowulf. And he has a video for free on YouTube. Uh, Benjamin Bagby Beowulf. Um, it is amazing. Here we are. And you guys can go and you can listen to this entire thing being performed live. And he really emphasizes this. Oh, wow. He's just about to start. I see. And he plays a harp as well. The harp he's playing is like um, a replica of the harp that was found at Sutton Hoo. Here we are. Wait, no. Here we are. Got a lot of good emphasis on there. Um, oh, let me let me give you guys that link so you can uh, watch it in your own time. It's really good. I recommend it. Um, really gives you an experience for what it would have been like to hear this poem, like recited originally. Um, right, let's go. Um, Tham Erfra was after Kenneth, a young in the album, than a god send a folk to Frofe, Furan fair for an yet, that he are drug on alder leas a lang a wheeler, him thus live frea, wolder as well, and world are for a yef. So, um, for them, a offspring was, um, born afterwards, young in the houses. Um, whom, and that's referring to the Eafra, and we know this because Thone is um, singular masculine, singular masculine accusative form, and this is a singular masculine that masculine word, Eafra, which is the descendant. So we know that it's referring back to the same one. Whom God sent uh, um, to the people as a comfort, as a consolation. Um, now this is a, a good example of how the word order in Beowulf can be quite off, right? So it's literally like him God sent to the people as a comfort. Um, and we can still follow along with it in English, but it's it sounds weird. We normally say God sent him to the people as a comfort. Um, so just be aware that the word order in Beowulf is quite weird. A good rule of thumb for this is that the yellow words that I've highlighted would generally be first in the sentence in modern English. And these red words would come after the verb. So... Um, he, what's, what's I'm looking for? He understood their dire need, a fiery need. It's quite cool language here. That he ardrugon alder leas a lange huile, because they previously had endured alder leas a um, elderless lange huile for a long while. Him thus lifrea wilders well than world are the freef. So 
let's go to our yellow first. That's going to be the first word. The um, life lord, Leif Freya. Weilden, the, the ruler, the wielder of wonder, to him, Vas, on account of this or because of this. And remember, this is one of those older uses of the word that suggests that it's an older poem. Warald Ara, worldly honor. Warald and Ara. Ara is honor, Warald is world. Foriaf, he um, gave him, he granted him, bestowed upon Beowulf. Uh, sorry, bestowed upon shield shaving. Or, or rather, I should say, sorry, bestowed upon the offspring of Shield, because that's what we're, who we're talking about here. And now we get the name Beowulf. <laughs> Beowulf was Brem, Vlad Weed Sprung, Shield is Ea for a Shield and in. So Beowulf was um, famous, his reputation leapt far. Um, Shield's a uh, descendant in southern Scandinavia. Um, Michael, yeah, of course. Um, if you scroll up in the chat, um, there is a link to what I've got right now. And obviously, like I've said, um, I've not done all of it. Um, that's the that's where I've finished working on it, chapter four, because um, there's tons of them. I do it week by week a little bit, you know, with you guys. Um, but yeah, to be sure, the original document will be um, will be available in a PDF. And if people want to take that and print it off for themselves, they can feel free to. I'm not making any copyright claims on this um, document. It's free for everyone. Um, and Jimmy asked, when's the next book reading with Simon? Um, it'll probably be next week. I've been I've been not doing much on my YouTube channel because honestly, it's been the heat wave. Like, it's been too hot. And today's been the first day that I've had, like, some headspace to actually do something, you know? So I was like, let's do some bail if it's fun. Um, I imagine Simon will be, has been similar, that maybe he's handling the heat better than I am. Um, so yeah, that it'll be coming next week. We'll be finishing the Critical Race Theory book, don't worry. Um, so yeah, so um, he was basically this line, so Beowulf was very famous in southern Scandinavia. So, so thus shall a young man with goodness perform from a fairgiftum on father bearma with bold um fairgiftum fair is money and giftum is gifts with money gifts um on father bearma in the lap of the father that hina on ilde eft ye wunien will ye see thus so that um what's the word Hina on Ilda Efti Winion. So it's like the well companions may remain with him in his age, basically. And it, it might be now that I'm thinking about it. No, I'm wrong. I, I, I was right the first time, I should say. In in his old age. Um Fono Wig Kuma Leo de Elaston. So um when the battle shall come the abandoned peoples. So these abandoned peoples are the um, the willing companions. Or, or actually, now that I think about it, no, no, I'm wrong. The Leori Elastin are the, um, they are the battle. They're not the well companions. So what this is saying is that the abandoned peoples are those people who are cast out of the Mead Hall environment. And He's, this line is saying that a young man should um, act with goodness and give out gifts um, in his father's like embrace in his bosom um, so that when or in the sort of guise of a father so that his companions will stay with him when he's old um, when the battle comes and when these like outcast people come because when he's older and maybe not able to defend himself, if he's been good to his thanes and his companions in life, they will stay with him and they will protect him from these outcast invaders. And th these two words really encapsulate Beowulf. They are a theme that comes up over and over again in the poem of outcast people coming back to get revenge on the whole society. It's really important. So... Lof dadum shell in mighty huara manya theon. Him thou shield your bat to shaphuile, 
hele hror ferdan on frean ware hi hinne tha at at barlon to brimes farve swa se yesitas swa he self abad fenden warden wild wine shieldinger so with praiseworthy deeds he shall in each of the peoples so they could pick that weird order with praise deeds he shall in each of the peoples a man and so that's like what it is he shall um perform so the, to, to do it in english it's like a man should perform with praiseworthy deeds with among each of, of the peoples so look at how much my um mouse is jumping around it's kind of crazy but that's the word order in old english and this is a poem so it's going to be a bit weird um him tha shield ye wat to ye shap wheel of fella for feran on frean wara so um shield departed from him at the fated time ye shap wheel so this is the shaped while the wheel is like the word while ye shap is like shapen um so it's the fated moment um fella hror very vigorous and this is referring to shield because it's also yellow um feiran to travel to depart on war freon into the lord's protection so this is obviously not a terrestrial lord this is um lord in heaven this is the leaf fair that we had earlier the life lord oh and hang on let's notice the connections of freya right um in the Norse religion Freya is uh, a god a goddess obviously and, and a god and so there are some there's some evidence that this term may have been the term of a deity for the pre-Christian Anglo-Saxons but we don't know we can't know for sure um it's a cognate also with the gothic word Freya so there we go right he hina va at baron so, they, him, then uh, transported or carried to the brimis to the um, blood of the sea, the dear companion, Yasitas. And that he carried, they carried shield shaving to the sea because he treated them well. Swahe self abad then the more them wailed when we know Schildinger, as he himself bade them while with words he ruled um the Lord of the Shieldings. So just as he himself, the Lord of the Shieldings, bade them while with words he ruled. So there we go. Lay off land from a lang achte. So the beloved lang um Landleader had possessed that land for a long time, so that land is just implied here. Achte, like he owned it. Thar ad hula stored, ringers devna isi on utfus, atheling is far. So this is really cool. Um, so there in the harbour stood, um, the ringers stefan the ring staved one, isi on utfus, icy and keen for journey, atheling is far. So you know in Tolkien how the elves are going off to, um, I think Beleriand, they're, they're, they're sailing off to this like place of immortality in these like really magical ships. Tolkien got this idea from Beowulf. He just like full on stole it. I mean, Tolkien stole almost everything <laughs> in Lord of the Rings from Beowulf. Um, but what I really like is this description here. Um, Ring and Stev now, Ring Saved, because... It really reminds me of the Osberg ship. And let's see if we can get any um, close-up images of the prow. Well, actually, this, this isn't rings yet. Let's look up um, Viking ship remains. There are some that definitely have this, like, ring, ringed stave design. Um, and you can, And it's just really cool that you can sort of picture this kind of thing going back into the sea so look at that you've got these like interlocking um we have these interlocking rings and creatures that's a poor definition image there we are here's a good high definition one we can see these interlocking rings up here and this is the kind of prow that would have been taking shield off to 
his death, really. Well, it's to the afterlife. And it's worth noting also with ships that, like with the Osberg ship, like with Sutton, who pagans tended to bury their noble kings in ships. And it's actually in one of my videos on my channel. If you go into um, if you go into my playlist and you look for um, reading medieval English tutorials, in the one on Beowulf, I talk about the um, difference between Sutton Hoo and Beowulf. Sorry, the, the way that Sutton Hoo has influenced Beowulf. Those are recordings of classes that I did ages ago, like as test runs for my university classes. Um, so I talk about Beowulf in that one as well. And I talk about how the discovery of Sutton Hoo really has shaped how we think about Beowulf in ways that we can't quite get out of our heads. Like, because um, the grave in Sutton Hoo is so similar to how Beowulf's tomb was described at the end of the poem that people just can't get out of their heads and so when we think of Beowulf now we think of the world of Sutton Hoo and if you go to the British Museum's Sutton Hoo ex exhibit right now um, they actually have quotes from Beowulf um, along the thing even though the burial itself Sutton Hoo is like a few centuries before even the earliest guesses for when Beowulf was composed and obviously the manuscript of Beowulf itself was much later so these, the poem and the burial are centuries apart, but we're still linking them so strongly in our head because of the similarity. It's just, it's fun. It's fun stuff, fascinating stuff. Um, anyway, so at the harbor, there stood this ringed staved boat. This, it's icy and it's keen for journey, Utfus, um, the, the voyage of a prince. I laid on the Leof Nathaudin, Berger Britain on Berum Schippers, Marne be Master. So, um, they led then the beloved king, great man, um, by the ma by the mast, the um, dispenser of treasures into the um, embrace of the ship, into the bosom of the ship, a great man at the mast. So these um, three red ones here, Leofna, Theoden, Britain, Marne, they're all the same one. They're all describing a uh, shield shaving, but they but they sort of use this very repetitive and um you know they're, they're saying the same thing with many different words because it's good for the poetry right so so this is the poet being like almost injecting himself into this, being like, this is my opinion of the whole thing. There was um, a great deal of treasures from Fairwayrum, from the far off paths, um, yeladed, um, loaded um, of treasures. Um, so, like, they're repeating that here as well, like, Fela Madma, many treasures, yeladed Fratwa, loaded with treasures. It's you know, it's a bit unnecessary. Um, I've never heard um, a vessel to be prepared more comingly, befittingly, with um, battle weapons and war gear, with swords and with corslets. So these are like um, suits of armor, basically, a uh, chainmail armor they would have had in the time. So this is the poet like jumping in and being like, I've never heard anything this good, guys. This is as good as it gets. So, him on Bermelai Madma Manio, tha him mit shoulder on Flores Acht, Ferdia Witan, na las hi hina lasan lacum teodon, Theodis Treonum, done da didon, the here at Flumshe after fort on Sendon, Anna over Ute Umborways in the. So, um, they, um, a great. A multitude of treasures lay with him in the bosom of the ship. So look at that order. It's almost like the exact um, opposite, right? So a multitude of treasures lay in the bosom of the ship with him. It's it's like exactly the opposite of what we do in modern English. Um, when um, they had to travel far with him, him mid, on Achtrales, into the floods, into the sea's ownership, into the sea's dominion. Um, so notice 
a quick thing here. Mid is the preposition for with, and it's going after him, because in Old English, prepositions can also be postpositions. It happens quite a lot, especially in poetry. Um, and this idea of the dominion of the sea is quite interesting, the sea having a lot of power and being this... <sighs> See, the sea is really interesting. Um, I should say the sea, as opposed to water within land. So we'll, we talked in last week's uh, stream of Beowulf, so you can look at that stream on my channel if you want to. We talked about how Hunferth calls out Beowulf for his toxic masculinity and he says, um, you went out to see Beowulf and you risked your life for just for the sake of a vain boast and it wasn't any good. Um, and I said how that, in that quote you can see how the sea is functioning as this arena in which Beowulf can prove his masculinity and I think the same thing is happening here to some extent like shield shaving is a very noble king so when he's laid to rest in his ship he goes into the sea's dominion he goes into this like realm of masculinity and maybe and I think there is definitely some um what's the word toned down pagan connotation with Valhalla because although Valhalla is a very different it's, it's described quite differently if I remember correctly actually if we think about in terms of societal roles what it is so Acht Flodes here we'll take these two words the, the, the sea's dominion if we look at functionally what this as a place is doing um compared to Valhalla, it's very similar. It's a place where young, it's a place where heroic men who have performed in a heroic masculine fashion, they go after they die, presumably to be with other heroic um, men in this um, arena where they can contest the masculinity because Valhalla is also, remember, an arena. It's where the warriors fight with each other and the sea is also an arena where Beowulf fights to prove his masculinity. So, I think that the sea in Beowulf is maybe functioning something like the, um, it's maybe functioning something like Valhalla, but it's being toned down. It's not being portrayed as as glorious because it's being written down in a Christian era, even if maybe the poem when originally composed thought of this in a much more positive light. Um, I had something else to say, but now it's set my mind, so we will, we will move. Oh yes, this, that was the last thing. Um, because it's very interesting to note in other Old English poems that the sea is almost, one could argue, rewritten. So in some poems like The Seafarer, which shows some evidence of a pagan poem which has been um, retrofitted for Christianity because at the end of the seafarer um, it's a bit of a weird poem in general but suddenly he's like going like right this is the um, the god bit this is like why all of what I've told you about my journey on sea means that you should glorify God and I read this as the seafarer is a poem that was um, pre-Christian about um, traveling out to the sea and maybe about the dangers of the sea and it was Christianized. Um, as the gods die again, is Valhalla really heaven? Um, Michael, so I'm not I'm not saying that either of these are heaven, like um, Flores Acht or Valhalla. What I'm saying is, um, because um, I think it's a different place, really. Um, Valhalla to heaven. And Tom Shippey, in his series of lectures on Tolkien's Beowulf on YouTube, they're really good, you should go and watch them. Um, talks about how Beowulf as a poem is sort of caught between uh, the pagan and Christian world. And Tom Shippey phrases the idea of like heaven, right? Um, so whether Valhalla or Flor des Acht or whatever, he phrases it as like the granny question. So Tom Shippey envisions the society that's composing and thinking about Beowulf as a society that where grandma is still pagan. Your parents became Christian. Maybe they have a mixture of Christianity and paganism and their children are mostly Christian. And this is a poem that's being told to their, to those children. Um, so like the very first generations of mostly or entirely Christians in England. And 
the granny question is like, well, what happens to grandma? If, if pagans go to hell, is my grandmother, who was a pagan but who I knew and who I know was a good person, is my grandmother in hell? And Beowulf is caught between these two, um, which I think is why it tries to, for the most part, avoid directly addressing matters of pre-Christian religion. So there are references to customs which, for the people of the time, we would assume would be pagan. And in fact, we know we're pagan um, because I believe even when this was written, um, um, many parts of Scandinavia were only just being Christianized and the poem was written long before then. The people who were being referred to here lived long, many centuries before Christianization of Scandinavia. We've got, she got, here we are, Sherlandum in. These events are happening right in Scandinavia. The shield is being buried in Scandinavia where they're worshipping Thor and Odin and Freya. Um, but what's happening here? They're describing the funeral for shield in these lines that we've seen here but they're not describing any gods um unless so this is an interesting one actually um so, so this one here war on war the Freyan. so this is the lord and it, it's the name for god in norse mythology um so maybe they're sort of this word Freya here is doing double duty. Maybe Freya here is doing double duty for the god of the sea, Flores Acht, this of this like arena of masculinity where people go after they die, and it's a Christian god. So it's like um, plausible deniability. So somebody listening to the poem, can, if they're a Christian, they can say, ah, well, Shield is going off to be with the Christian god. And a pagan can listen to it, or somebody sympathetic to paganism can listen to it and say, Freya is going to be with the other manly men in this arena of masculinity in the dominion of the sea god. Um, so maybe, I mean, maybe this is just me like throwing crazy conjecture out there. Um, take from it what you will. But it's a really fascinating idea. And um, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you guys um, go and watch Tom Shippies, he did them for Sigmum, Signum University, and I will say that also to everyone actually, because um, one of the things I want to do on my channel is um, provide for free the kinds of education that you normally need to go to university for, and there are many barriers to university, not everyone has the time or uh, money or resources necessary to go to university, um, but they're still interested in old English poetry and they want to learn it, so I'm trying to do everything I can to give it to you guys for free on here. Um, Sign Signum, sorry, University um, is innovating in delivering this kind of stuff online. So you can get like, an, you can get online classes from them in, and, and they're really specializing in J.R. Tolkien's vision. Uh, if I <laughs> grab my Tolkien portrait that I have on this book that's um, on my shelf, they're really trying to um, bring Tolkien's vision of philological study back because people even in my field of academic study, aren't really, um, students aren't really dealing too much with the Old English original poetry. My students read Beowulf in translation, for instance, and I think that's a great shame. Sigmund, Signum University are trying to bring back teaching of these languages, and so they have classes on Old Norse, um, Old English, and, and they have a class where you read Beowulf from start to finish in the original Old English. Now, you do have to pay um, I don't know their rates, I'm not affiliated with them. I should put this caveat, I'm not affiliated with Sigmund, Signum University. I just think it's a good option for somebody who maybe wasn't able to go into, um, or didn't want to go into traditional academia, but still wants to learn Old English from a professional source. They can um, go to uh, Signum University and they can take those classes there. Alternatively, if people want, I have a Patreon that's on my, um, on my channel and the Patreon is basically a way for people to get um, tuition from me. So you'll see it on there. There's like a, a level that's like 15 a month and then you get like an hour or two of tuition from me uh, in a medieval language every month. Pleasure, pleasure Michael. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad people are enjoying it. Um, so yes, so, sorry to, to have gotten so distracted with that um, thing about the um, about whether or not, you know, 
child is going to the Christian heaven or some kind of Anglo-Saxon Valhalla. I shouldn't even say Anglo-Saxon. No, I'm wrong. Because remember, these people are Scandinavian. The poem is probably being sung among the Anglo-Saxons. And there's one Anglo-Saxon king, King Offa, who is mentioned in this poem. But actually, it's... um. These are pagans, but that's what I'm saying, right? So that's what Tom Shippey is saying as well about being caught between um, the Christian and the pagan because they're describing a funeral. But there's no mention of him going to Thor or Odin or anything like this, um, unless, like I said, you count this reference here, which I think is a way of, you know, cashing their bets and covering both boxes and being Christian and pagan at the same time by saying he's going to the lords or the gods. Um, protection, right? Which which God is it is up to the reader to decide. And I think that's very deliberate as a choice. Um, I do, I mean, I should caveat that I'm not like really well read on Beowulf. There's more scholarship have been written on Beowulf than anyone could read in their lifetime. I, unironically, there's a book um, in my local library um, which just, <laughs> it just lists the major scholarly papers written on Beowulf by like by like decade and by subject and it's <laughs> it's so much and it's a thick book like just for a list of references so I've not read much or any of that I'm sure there's plenty to read I'm just saying all this to say that I'm not an expert on Beowulf this is so I do agree with Tom Shippey because I've heard Tom Shippey's arguments on that but you know there may be better arguments that I haven't heard um and I'm a bit open to them you know anyway let's go on um, the point is, this poem is between the Christian and Pagan, um, and in this description of Shield Funeral, they're not talking about the gods specifically because they want to keep this ambiguous. Right. Let's go on. Now, las hi hine lasum lacum teoran. So, um, no less or nonetheless, um, they should, um, they provided him with a lesser gift with Theodiasoenum, which I've translated as Moorish gifts, as in like, you know the English word, um, Moorish, like, I don't know, scones and, scones and cream, and clotted cream is Moorish, and garden gnomes in England are Moorish, with a good, and a good cup of tea is Moorish, that kind of Moorish. Um, so, folkish Moorish treasures. Um, and I think that's quite interesting, actually, um, for, for a few different ways. So, this las and lacum, right? First of all, they're talking about... So first of all, they're talking about the most important things that are going into his burial. And we see these things at Sutton Hoo as well. We see um, we see chainmail armor at Sutton Hoo. These are the birn. We see um, bill. We see swords at Sutton Hoo, um, etc. So these are the more important things. They come first in the description. And then he says that they, they've given some lesser gifts, some lesser, lesser treasures. And we see these in Sudden Who as well. There's things like um, board games and a liar, smaller, maybe less symbolically essential um, treasures that are buried with the Sutton Who prints. And, and then they mention the Theodostreonum. And I wonder if this Theodostreonum is referring to foreign people. So maybe I shouldn't have put Moorish. Maybe I should have said it's foreign people because in Sutton Hoo, we actually have a great emphasis on um, treasures that come from far away. So they come from Byzantium in, in um, sort of um, Anatolia. They cut some some of the materials come from India. Um, it's treasures from all around the old world, really. And maybe that's what they're referring to here. This treasure of like bringing the whole world into the pagan ship burial. Anyway. Um, then they did those things. Um, so, so then those people, so these are the people who are burying Shield with all of these things. Um, they sent him. Now, this is not referring to um, this is not referring to um, Shield. This is referring to Beowulf. Um, so they sent him forth at Frumshafter at the beginning at creation. Um, Anna alone over Ithe, over the waves, um, umbor weisende, um, being a child. So Hina, umbor and Anna, they are all, um, 
red and they don't have a preposition like of either. So they all go together. So they sent um, him alone, being a child, forth at creation over the wave. So they went, they sent Beowulf overseas, basically. Right. Far, far you hear him aseton, saying yelden her over herford. Late on. Wait, am I wrong? No, I am wrong. I'm very sorry. This is weird. Hold on. Let me just check this actually. Because I'm wondering if Umborwesende is actually a plural, because it can be. Sorry. Whether it's actually um, a nominative plural. Umborwesende. Here we are. Let's have a. Let's check this. No. It. Like, at least according to the gloss in the bail in the um, electronic Beowulf, my gloss is correct. So they sent him alone over being a child. And I don't know, maybe this... So what's confusing is maybe they're referring to Beowulf here. And then they're talking about S.H.I.E.L.D. again here. It, is, it does seem a bit weird to me. Anyway, right. Um... Right, cool. Anyway, right. Thy yit hie him a set on Sayen Yeldena, Herr offer Herford, let on home baron, Yafon on Garsage. So then still they set on him a golden, sorry, a golden uh, banner high over his head. Um, they let the sea carry him, Yafon on Garsage, they gave him onto the sea. Uh, him, that's to them. Was Yermo Sefat more than the Maud. So the the mind the mind was for them um more than the um what's the word? Mourning, basically. A mourning mind, um a gloomy mind. This is another example of what I said earlier where they'll just repeat something. So Yermo Sefa more than the mood. Yermo Sefa is like a gloomy mind, more than the mood. It's a morning mind. It's basically the same thing, but they're repeating it because it's good for the um, alliteration. Because you can get ye o mor sefa mor than the mod, and then men. You know, so that's why they repeat themselves. Men ne kunan se janto sota sele raden halen under hevonum hua dam laster on bang. So men could not say in truth the um. This is a great word sele raden the marvel tellers. Um, or the Marvel readers, um, the heroes under the heavens, um, sort of what them plaster with that load on Feng. So, or rather where that load took him. So men cannot say, maybe that's like where is a better way of translating that. Um, the Garasej, the sea, took him with that load of treasure. So they're saying that the men don't know where S.H.I.E.L.D. went. And actually, maybe that's literally meant to give us a wink and a nod about the ambiguous nature of this poem. So earlier I said that this bit here, on Freyanwara, um, onto the dominion of the sea, sorry, of, of the Lord, and then we see a, re a repetition of the same thing on Acht Flores, onto the um, uh, dominion of the sea. Um, we see the exact same pattern repeated. So notice we've got um, red, green, red, and then we have uh, red, green, red here. I think this is um, playing up to something that like there's an ambiguity of like whether it's the Christian God or some kind of pagan God of the sea. And they're saying here, the men didn't know where um, or, or why it was the sea received the sea received him basically the, the men don't know where he went with all that treasure whether he went to the christian heaven or to the uh, pagan afterlife and i think that's a really exciting aspect to it so that's the first chapter we did it lads we went through the first chapter of beowulf and now we have basically come to the um to the glossing part i'll read through this very quickly for you because I, I glossed the first one and what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be going through these the rest of chapter two, which is mostly uncolored, and I'm going to put the colors in and show you guys how to understand the grammar as we go through. 
Um, so, um, I'm also probably going to clip this at some point and uh, put it online. It's like reading an analysis of the first chapter of Beowulf, whatever. So that'll be a discreet video for people. Right, so, and Beowulf chapter two, this will be the last one of me reading and explaining it to you or translating it for you. So, then Beowulf of the Shieldings was in the enclosures, or in the cities, I should say. Uh, the, the beloved people king, Leod Kuning, um, long at Raga for a long time, um, Yefraya Volkum, sort of famous among the people. Um, father Elar Huerf, Aldar of Erla. This is really interesting. So, his father, Beowulf's father, who is Shield, who remember we just saw buried, um, he disappeared elsewhere, the elder from the earth. And it's really cool that they don't specify where that Elor is, whether it's, again, the Christian or the pagan afterlife. Really interesting. Anyway, of that, him eft on walk her health dinner um, until the um, high half Dane arose for them afterwards, held while he lived, um, or he ruled while he lived. Sorry, he ruled the um, happy shieldings while he lived. This is the half Dane. Um, while he lived old and uh, battle fierce. So they're saying that Beowulf, obviously because he's a child, is too young to take rule. So after um, after S.H.I.E.L.D. passed away, we have this guy called Halfdane who comes to rule the Shieldings in Scandinavia. So now we are on to here. I'm going to go through and I will gloss it for you guys. And if you guys have any questions about any of this lot, feel free to ask and I'll try and answer as best I can.